for showing up. The session right after really good heavy lunch is always the hardest. So I appreciate you guys making up all the way up here. I see as well some familiar faces from the other, uh, from the earlier talk I gave, the meta programming one. Thank you for coming back. Um, makes me happy again. Um, this is um, um, the rise of NoSQL and polyglot um, persistence. This is a little bit about me. I work for Just Me. Um, I'm a frequent speaker in, all these, all, in a lot of conferences. And they started a bunch of users groups and organizations uh, over the years. And that's my Twitter account at Polymathic um, Coder. Um, again, the same thing. This uh, presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons license. So feel free to um, use it and don't make any money out of it. And just uh, say that it was uh, my work. Um, so the way I would like to, s I don't like, usually I don't like to have an agenda because when you have an agenda in a talk, it kind of give people the idea of, um, it's more of a distraction because they're always waiting for like the next thing. So I would like to pretty much just let the, 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 the talk kind of flow in a, in a, I mean, call it organic manner, whatever you would, what you would like to call it. But the first thing that I, would, I, I, want, I wanted to talk about is pretty much relational databases to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And the first section is pretty much the golden age of relational databases, as you see in the title. So what a relational data store is, um, it's been pretty much the technology that has been uh, dominant or like just the obvious source of storing data over the years um, because of many reasons. Uh, we have a lot of um, existing material solutions, Oracle, MySQL, to name a few. And it was just pretty much a wide adoption of the technology and a lot of familiarity even by, by de developers or advanced business users themselves. Um, and there was an abundance, uh, an abundance of tooling out there. So it pretty much almost became the de facto uh, standard for storing data uh, over the years. Um, to the point that we just pretty much assumed that we're gonna have a relational database. We, we assumed that we're either gonna run on MySQL and on Oracle if we can afford it. Uh, and what a relational model is, uh, is pretty much this data, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, that is stored in these two dimensional tables or relations in the form of pretty much rows and, and uh, column attributes. As a well-defined enforced schema, that means that the relationship between the data itself uh, in those tables is well-defined um, and enforced, and there was a lot of integrity constraints that are enforced. Uh, integrity constraints uh, like the type of the data or referential integrity like the relationship between the data itself. Um, and anybody that did any work with the relational model knows that normalization is pretty much a, a um, um, good practice. And what normalization is, is pretty much these small tables, well-defined relationship between them to minimize redundancy and to pretty much avoid modification anomalies. So no redundant data whatsoever is just was considered to be a bad thing. And if you have a table, a, a, a table, a table of departments and employees, when you delete the department, you would um, assume or you would, would, uh, you would like that all the uh, employees that are linked to that particular um, department are deleted as well because there is that, refer that referential integrity of that propagation that is um, supposed to be, that, 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 that we would expect or we li would like to happen. So this relational model is also supported by SQL, which is a somewhat standardized query language that we're familiar with. It's very flexible and it supports a lot of operations that, uh, that are across multiple relations or across multiple tables such as, uh, as joints. And it allows us to go very nice aggregations with statements like group by, et cetera. So it's a very nice um, um, language that we, we enjoyed using over the years. Um, one important feature that the relational model has is pretty much to be able to, uh, to is transactions, to be transactional and what we call these ACID transactions, and ACID stands for atomicity, that means it's all or nothing. I do um, um, a lot of, uh, I change a bunch of data and it's treated as one, uh, one, uh, one unit. It either happens or everything pretty much gets uh, rolled back to, uh, uh, to before, uh, which uh, ties into the second one is consistency. That means that every time we do a transaction on this database, it takes it from one valid state to the next one, to another valid one. 
and the isolation, which is pretty much concurrency, is taken care of for us by the system. We never worry when we use an RDBMS of a lot of clients querying the database or changing it, whatever it is, we expect that to just pretty much be taken care of by the RDBMS system. And durability, uh, once committed, it's forever. I mean, this is not an in-memory database. When the machine crashes, everything just goes away. This is something the changes are uh, persisted uh, on disk. So it's really important to kind of understand the, um, um, the reasons or the design trade-offs uh, that the people who first created these RDBMS systems pretty much took. And this, this, this model was pretty much brought forth uh, because of many assumptions that they made. The first one is that the end user would directly interact with the database. So, um, so Im meaning that there is this guy, there is this data right there, and there's this guy sitting in front of a terminal writing SQL statements. That's pretty much how it, it all started. And he can enter data in, he can query it back, and so forth. And it makes sense that the RDBMS should manage concurrency and integrity of that data, right, if we're designing a system like that. And um, um, this means also that the access patterns are unknown. Um, SQL is very flexible. I mean, we're talking about an infinite combination of queries uh, of data and everything. You're just giving it to a user and giving him this language to pretty much use. Um, and so SQL became that way, a flexible query language close to English. And what we ended up doing is we stored data in these data structures that have no bias towards any particular pattern of querying. We want this model that would support any pattern of querying because we just don't know about it. I mean, it's up to the user to um, uh, do that. So the data, and the, the other assumption is that the database runs on a single machine. Uh, the distribution was not something that we considered to begin with. I mean, uh, we just didn't have enough data then. So the only way to promise um, um, the, the database that runs on a, on, on a single machine was anyways the only way to promise ASIN. Only way to promise pretty much that your data, that your, uh, that, that, that your data is, that your operations are going to be transactional. So we had some road bu bumps throughout the year. Th this has been working very well for us. It has been working great, uh, no complaints. But we still, what happened is that we started building more complex applications on top of these relational databases. Um, a lot of the business logic moved out of the business databases to the application layer uh, itself. We started writing, uh, started hating triggers. Uh, we started not writing a lot of sort procedures anymore. Uh, we, all that code kind of moved to the application layer as these uh, uh, new frameworks and new languages and platforms evolved out of the database. The second thing is that these applications themselves that we built outside of the database itself evolved beyond the procedural paradigm and became more OOP. So all of a sudden, we have this object relational model um, um, that, is, that kind of looks at data and structures it in a way that is completely different than the database itself, and we have what is called the object relational impedance mismatch. Uh, it sucked, but a lot of people put a lot of work into these um, ORM frameworks. Uh, we have Hibernate, we have all of these things, and everything was pretty much uh, made our life a lot easier. You have an um, inheritance, something that does not, or like a hierarchy, something that does not um, um, translate to the relational model, and you just annotate it uh, using JPA to kind of figure out like an inheritance strategy of how that data is supposed to be persisted and queried back from the database, and it was great. I mean, it's not really that big of a deal. Next. So, next section is about scalability. You can just go to the next page. So, uh, we start, we became data hoarders. As the database grow up, you know, grow out of pretty much control, more data, we started putting a lot of more data into them, we started querying a lot more data, so and the performance pretty much just decreased exponentially. So we started spending a lot of money, buying the next big machine with multi-cores, buying Oracle Rack and making this guy even richer, like he needs more money. And they kind of put the problem off for a while. We just buy this new Oracle Rack and everything is good. Now performance is uh, back to an acceptable level. So we got to the point that we have the most expensive machine out there. We spend millions of, on dollars of this one. 
but we're still not getting really good performance, so we hired this guy that walks in to optimize our database. He walks in there and then he creates secondary indexes all over the place. Certainly made a lot of queries, a lot of joins a lot faster. Uh, he said, you know what? Uh, we're gonna actually go and create some materialized views. And for those of you for complex joins, for those of you who are not familiar with familiarized views, she's pretty much just the result. Um, um, the result of a query, the data set of a query, um, that is pretty much pre-fetched pre for you by the database. Um, that is stored, cached for you by the database. There are different, um, different, uh, different types of views. Some of them happen during the runtime and some of them pretty much would happen periodically. So um, anyways, I went off on a tangent on that for a little bit, but they were like a nightmare to maintain and they got stale. And the ones that are not, um, the, ones, the ones that are not real, real time pretty much became useless. And the ones that are uh, real time didn't really mean anything. Uh, because performance still sucks. So he said we need to denormalize. We just couldn't join four tables with all this data and get good performance. So we did. It was horrible. You know, we ended up with this redundancy that we did not want to begin with, and we have to pretty much manage it. Um, so the guy said, you know what? Um, we're going to introduce caching. We introduced caching. The data is too stale. We have even more redundancy on top of that. We need to worry about when do we evict the cache and when it was just a mess. Anyways, next one. So we hired another guy, right, who's supposed to be smarter. And this guy just pretty much tells us that we hit the limit of the one machine. That uh, we should pretty much scale out of scale horizontally. That means we should have a cluster of machines instead of the one machine. Big problem. Um, Remember that RDBMS was not designed that way, but we we're gonna sit down and then try to think of other creative solutions. He tells us that we have two options. The first one is a master-slave kind of architecture that assumes that you're actually um, reading a lot more than writing, which is the case in a lot of systems. And, um, uh, but the problem with that is you write to the master and there is this time uh, that you would have to wait for your data to pretty much be replicated. Uh, for the rest of the, the, the slaves that pretty much provide the reading, which means that you're risking that you're reading, a re uh, you're, you're risking that you're going get, to get data that is not consistent. Another one down, no consistency. Um, so it w that was kind of a problem. And then he said, all right, if you don't want to do that, you know, for one of these reasons, for, for, because you read and write, uh, uh, the ratio of the read, the read, uh, read and write is pretty much, um, does not work for you you're writing as much as you're reading, let's shard all this data. And what sharding is, that's pretty much you take your data set and you pretty much um, divide it across the cluster based on some kind of strategy. You could say that everybody's last names from A to C are going in machine one, from C to Z are going in machine two and such, right? And you try to kind of keep an equal load. Um, the, if uh, one of the machines pretty much uh, uh, grows out of control, you kind of reshard it again, try to keep that data distribution even uh, to an extent. It was a big problem because all of a sudden we couldn't join across partitions. You just couldn't do those joins anymore. You just, uh, because the data is literally in different databases. But it, it, it was a significant improvement of read because, uh, of reads and writes at the same time. No referential integrity, you know, across tables. Uh, we kind of required the modification of our client applications. So all of a sudden, the client applications needs to be aware of where the data exactly is in the shard. And it was a problem. Uh, so uh, we kind of introduced, again, a single point of failure. One of the machines dies, one, one machine dies, and pretty much you lose like a big sub subset of your data right there. How's that consistent? Next one. So what's the point? We vertically scale our relational database. We're no longer consistent. No longer no acidity anymore. We're no longer acid, and we lose the query flexibility. Uh, so, are we doing something wrong? Maybe. All right. So, the next thing I want to introduce is the cap theorem, and what cap theorem is uh, is um, this uh, is something that was 
um, introduced by Eric Brewer on distributed systems, pretty much for any distributed system, has nothing to do with databases. So it says that pick, out, pick two out of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Pretty much, if you are consistent and available, no partition tolerance. If you are available and, and you have partition tolerance, tolerance, you're not consistent, and I missed one, and so forth. This is kind of similar to fast, cheap, good service. There's no fast, cheap, good service. A <laughs> cheap, good service won't be fast, and fast, good service won't be cheap, and fast, cheap service won't be good. So you can only have two of them. Next one. So the relational model and cap. The relational model data store happens to actually favor consistency and availability. What we mean by that, and every time you query the database, there's video for you and gives you some pretty much answer back, and it's 100% consistent. So this is for historical, historical reasons. Uh, we have certain type of applications that require that. Banks. Everybody knows the example, I deposit $100 in my friend's bank account and all that kind of stuff. And you, you know, I'm not even going to go into an example. But according to CAP, partition tolerance is impossible, which means that uh, it's impossible for you to horizo horizontally pretty much scale. Because partition tolerance means you have a distributed system. Right? Um, so by CAP, the relational model is impossible to be distributed. Right. So, yeah, um, we are in a pickle. We have too much data in a CA model. Uh, vertical scaling is too expensive, and it's pretty much not sustainable. I mean, uh, it doesn't really matter. Depend, it doesn't really matter how how much money you have. You're gonna buy the most expensive machine, and you're gonna have pretty much like more data. And you're gonna have um, um, more data sooner or later. So that pretty much forced us to kind of explore other um, alternatives in light of CAP itself. So we say, all right, partition tolerance, since we reached the limit of the one machine, we want to be pretty much like, we have no other scale, that, uh, no other choice that's scaling out, right? Which means to be partition tolerant. We have like some kind of store that has all this um, instance, this cluster of machines and kind of manages them in a way. And we want to be available. We always want to be available. So nobody is, is, is pretty much willing to give this up, to give availability up. Because, the, but um, and the good news is like it becomes even better with distribution. If you have one machine, it's hard for you to keep the machine always av available. We usually would have always like a stand, um, a standby machine and all that kind of stuff. With distribution, um, it's even cheaper and, and, and better because the cluster as a whole um, it's inherent, inherently more reliable and more available than the pretty much one machine as a whole. Uh, you can have one die, but your whole system is still there. It's still standing, serving customers. So anyways, according to CAP, we simply cannot have consistency. You know, um, that means that I make an update and also, uh, and what consistency is, just to be clear, maybe I should have um, discussed this before, is what, what it means to be consistent is that you make one write and you update a record, everybody who reads the data right after that write gets the most, the same most recent value I wrote to the database. Right? There's no in between there. And this is impossible, so they're not gonna work out, work out for us. So we said, all right, uh, let's look up um, like an AP system, something that is partition tolerance and, and um, partition tolerant and available all the time. And the first thing that comes to mind is a, a DNS server, right? Um, you go and you register uh, nosql.com, right? And we have, let's say, 100 DNS servers, uh, servers, right, owned by two companies. The first company update their record. The second one doesn't. I mean, it takes two days or three days for all the data to pretty much propagate. So you go in, the, uh, you try uh, nosql.com. You don't really get an IP back. But the next day, eventually, you're going to get, I mean, it would be in every server, in every DNS server out there. So it's just like a matter of time because they kind of need to communicate that change um, to all the nodes that are there to serve you um, the, um, that IP address, that record. Next. So what we're talking about is um, what is called eventual consistency, which is uh, not so bad. It just means that we're just going to not give up consistency altogether. Uh, all but what we're going to do is like 
just settle for like a lesser degree of consistency, data is going to be avail avail eventually um, available. Um, this is kind of scary in a way. It could work for you and cannot, depending on what kind of system you're doing. Right? Some people even argue that this could work for banks as well. And we can discuss that later. But anyways, this guy goes and updates his relationship status uh, to single. He's got somebody else in Spain that goes to Facebook and refreshes that page and it says that he became single and available. But over somewhere else in the United States, Sarah does not um, see that change yet. It just says that he's in a relationship still because she is, she, she is, does not have access. She's on a different edge node she does, where the data is, not, is still stale. It's not updated. But his brother in... Um, where? His brother in Japan gets it like three days later. Who cares? They're all going to get that information one day, I mean, over like a day or like over an hour or like two hours, but it's not really critical for them to get it immediately. It's not like a, the $100 example. So it's cool that we can, that eventually uh, consistency is totally cool within this application. So this is as opposed to immediate consistency. So the compromise, pretty much, is we would settle for a weaker consistency model. This weaker consistency model we call base as opposed to acid, uh, which is basically available, soft state. So you are in this soft state where some of the data is updated, some of it is still stale, and eventual consistency. And that all the soft state is pretty much going to be translated to the most current one um, correctly. So we're talking acid on the individual node based on the cluster. Right? Next. Slippery slope of the faithless. I don't know why I picked that, but hang on. So you might ask, um, we might as well ask questions, yeah. We doubted this uh, consistency thing and this acid that the RDBMS, you know, preaches and says that it's a must-have. We might as well start doubting everything else that this model brings in, right? So we're right there. So a schema. We we're talking about a logical schema that we had is well defined and rigid in relational databases. You can't change the schema. So why not even have a flexible schema or not even no schema at all? Let's just throw all this schema away. Actually, it would be good for certain applications because uh, you never know how your data is going to be evol is going to, to evolve 10 years from now. You start collecting the name, first name, a last name, and phone number of certain users all of a sudden, it's a requirement that you should keep, a keep track of their emails as well. Or we'll try to do that in a relational database. It would be a nightmare, right? To, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy. Or like physical schema itself. Most of these da databases rely on B3 structures, right? So why not use some other end of line data structure that would um, uh, be, uh, more, be more consistent with the natural um, um, data structure of the nat natural way our data that we're trying to model organizes itself um, uh, as, or like clusters as, would be a better one. And the integrity constraints, who cares? You know, we have all these databases that you have, this one needs to be a test, text, this one needs to be a number in this relationship, um, uh, foreign key, primary key relationship, all that kind of stuff. We can even like throw that away, I mean, if, if, if you want, if it's not as important for you. Um, because you can never achieve 100% consistency. You can choose to manage that on the application layer. And uh, query language, is SQL really that, you know, do we really care about SQL that much? I mean, it's nice to have, but what if we don't even care for it? It's like something that comes pretty much secondary. Why? Because there's always the application that goes and gets the data for us. We interact with the application. We don't interact with the black screen and sit there and then write pretty much SQL statements for reporting all day as we used to do ages ago. Not anymore. All these nice web interfaces and that do a lot of stuff for us. So SQL, who cares? We hate it anyways. I mean, anybody who uses Hibernate never goes back and writes JDBC code. Security, um, RDBMS comes with security, uh, a lot of security. Um, do we really, have, I, I bet you, <laughs> 70%, this is just a random number of us, um, create their JDBC connections on like root, as root, whatever it is, or MySQL, or doesn't really matter much. 
uh, or like as like a different as the one user. The entire cluster just hits the database with the same credentials, root, password, whatever it is. So name it. Anything that this relational model mo model brings, we're willing to question because we lost the most important thing is the ability to pretty much scale. We hit a wall, the wall of the one machine. Um, next one. So no SQL. All right. Um, so what this NoSQL is, that you keep hearing about, um, it is not really something in particular. It is pretty much such a wide range of specialized data stores with the goal of addressing the challenges of the relational model. One of these challenges happened to be uh, the inability for it to be distributed, or the inability for it to, be scale, uh, to scale out or scale ho horizontally. As Eric Evans, the guy who, who coined the terms, put it, the whole point of seeking alternative is that you need to solve a problem that relational databases are, bad, are a bad fit for. You know, as simple as that. Um, instead of the assumption that, oh, we have to use a relational database and we have to solve it this way and make your life harder. So let me make it easier. It does not mean anti-SQL or anti-relational. Um, any data store that is non-relational, that's pretty much what it means. Anything non-relational is no SQL. And somebody came up with not only SQL instead of no SQL thing, but that came like later. So I don't know if any. Uh, but anyways, no SQL is non-relational. Next one. Just to compare and contrast these things like in a little bit, uh, be mindful that there are some outliers. No, we're, we're talking about the relational model versus like 10 different models or, you know, tens of open source projects out there that makes different design decisions and, make diff and choose different trade-offs. So NoSQL usually runs, designed to run on a single, a single machine. Most of NoSQL te technologies would be designed to run on a cluster of mach machines. NoSQL is a CA, other uh, SQL CA, other NoSQL technologies would have AP, CA, CP, sometimes um, the sometimes like even different degrees of consistencies and different degrees of C's out there, uh, as long as you're willing to pretty much pay for it. And um, DynamoDB is an example of that, and MongoDB is an example of that as well. Uh, SQL scales vertically, you know, and then NoSQL usually scales horizontally. Uh, if you give a NoSQL a bigger machine, it'll take, make, take, uh, I mean, it'll, it'll take advantage of the processing power, but it's designed to scale horizontally, unlike even commodity, commodity machines. SQL, um, um, SQL relies on SQL, or relational databases rely on SQL. Uh, no SQL usually have these custom APIs, pretty much do not. The, there is no DSL on top of these things. I mean, usually you're just going to have to make a series of uh, method calls. SQL is ACID. We talked about ACID as well. No SQL is base. Uh, SQL supports full indexing of the database. I mean, usually the primary keys are indexed, but anything that you will query by or put like on a where statement, Right? You can create a second uh, index for and get pretty much better performance. Um, no SQL, most, mostly on keys, only, mostly. Some databases um, uh, vary. Uh, another thing, uh, SQL has a rigid schema that you cannot change, or it's hard to change. And a lot of no SQL is pretty much does not have any sch schema at all, does not enforce it. Uh, SQL would allow you to have flexible, flexible queries. In no SQLs, you actually have to have predefined queries and kind of design your data database on more than the way you would query data versus, um, versus modeling your data to support any, any, any combination of queries or like any query out there. Uh, well, actually I have that over there. So SQL as in relational is concerned about what, what the data consists of. So no redundancy and the tables and the relationship between each other and all that kind of stuff is well defined in the schema. But in non-relational, they're concerned of how the data is pretty much queried, right? Um, so if you're, um, if, you have, if you're querying, for example, an, an employee, first name, last name, and his department, wherever it is, it's very common for a NoSQL database to have that pretty much on one table. You create like a one index table that has all that information, so you have like pretty much easy access to it. Of course, there are outliers, of course. Yeah, this thing I found online, but you know, the guy hates relationships. Anyways, the zoo. All right. So what the zoo is, I'm pretty much going to go over. 
um, like a taxonomy or like uh, different kinds of relational databases and kind of talk, feature some of them and talk about them a little bit here and um, um, just a little bit. So and give you kind of an idea when to use them versus when um, uh, not to and the challenges that are associated with them. And the first one is pretty much the key value data, key, key value data source. This is very simple, probably like it's just a big hash map or a big um, associative array. That's it right there, distributed across this large, large cluster. Extreme, very simple, very fast reads and writes. You know, you just go, give me this record, return this record. And no, so unfortunately, no secondary indexes. Your only index is pretty much the key, so you can only query data by that particular key. That's it. If you decide to kind of filter by one of the values, the different values in your table, you're talking about full table scans. Um, I don't think that's a good idea at all, even if you use map reduce or anything like that, because as your data grows, uh, the performance of your um, queries is gonna decrease. Um, when to use this guy, use it when your data is not highly related. There's not a lot of relationship between your data. Uh, and pretty much use it when all you need is just basic CRUD, basic pretty much read and, 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 and write. Uh, there are certainly challenges with complex queries. If you have a complex uh, query, uh, you're gonna have to literally go and duplicate data into index tables and um, um, query those tables instead of the original, instead of the original data set. Um, check out the Amazon Dynamic paper. It's a very good read. Um, um, you know, was, uh, that's, uh, the link for it is up there, but if you Google for it, you're not gonna have a problem uh, finding it. Uh, featured project, of course, DynamoDB um, from Amazon, uh, React, and uh, Redis. The next thing I want to talk about is um, column-based or column-family data stores. What these things are, they're pretty much just a table, you know, when data in the same column is stored together. So this is a data structure that is completely different from the way tables are uh, structured in a relational database. In a relational database, you have the concept of a row. Data is in rows, right? But right here is like you have, um, instead of an actual row that is monolithic, you have like a linked list of columns or linked list of column families. This makes it pretty much like easier to uh, just go and fetch like an entire column of like the database or an entire pretty much like column family. It's uh, great for sparse tables. In a relational database, if you remember your Oracle, wherever it is, you have to do ver, in ver, uh, care 24. That reserves 24 whatever that thing is, bytes, wherever, or 24 characters for your queries. So every one of those tables has like pre-reserved space that you pretty much end up wasting per row, even if half of your values are pretty much null. It doesn't matter whether they're null or not, the space is reserved. This is great because if you have a null, it doesn't get stored in disk. So you save a lot of space um, in these guys. Um, but so storage is not wasted. They're very f they have very fast column operations, including ag aggregations. Use it when you have big data. They have excellent leverage of uh, um, MapReduce um, and technologies like pretty much Hadoop. HBase runs on Hadoop as well. And they perform really well on large, uh, large clusters. The challenge is, is that you better know your access patterns really well beforehand. And key design is not trivial. To give you an example with that, uh, don't expect serial, for example, keys for um, uh, some, a, a table, because what that means is all your data is gonna end up in node one, and node one is gonna have to handle all the load of the queries. So you wanna be mindful that your data is dif distributed across the entire cluster if you wanna take full advantage of the map reduced technologies. If you happen to query by um, zip code, for example, employee and zip code, make sure that you start, all your queries would start or like would have, um, you know, and after the, sec the byte number 13, the zip code right there, so you can just go scan those, uh, um, scan the keys and look for like a particular pattern within the key itself. So the way relationships are established is by actually creating a composite key itself in the, in, in, in the database. Uh, there are a lot of best practices out there and the HBase documentation is great for that. Check out the Google's, Google's Big ta Table paper as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a good one. It's available online. Uh, featured projects, HBase and Cassandra. How am I doing time-wise? Okay, next. 
So the last one I want to talk about, not the last one, actually, I lied. The third one I want to talk about is document-based stores. Uh, what these document-based stores are pretty much just nested structures of hashes and their values. I mean, it's just, they're just like documents, well structured the way XML is. So you have, well, like, let's use JSON as an example, because um, a lot of these guys would actually store the actual JSON. JSON would have like an object and it would have values, but it, would, it can have nested structures as well. So if your data looks like that, um, a lot of our data looks like that. You have like a user and the user have this and that, have um, you know, a profile and such. Um, use it. They're, um, they're very flexible. They have a very flexible schema. Doesn't really matter. I mean, you can have a user with name and first name. You can have another user with like a whole different, you know, with his profile information in there. It doesn't really care what schema is right there. And it has no limit in depth. You can have a nested, 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 and these structures, you know, forever. They don't really care. It's, a very, it's very flexible. Well indexed data. This is something that a lot of NoSQL databases actually um, um, uh, miss is the ability to do queries, this one where this one equals that and get like acceptable, and have that pretty much that capability to begin with and get acceptable performance. And um, um, yeah, and, and it relies on these um, big data technologies to uh, perform that well. Uh, it works very well for OOP, no impedance mismatch. Well, uh, that's kind of obvious in a way. Uh, but um, deformalized, that should be denormalized. The more denormalizing is pretty much the best practice. So um, you want to be as flat as possible in Dynamo, the same way that you would take your data and serialize it into XML or like serialize it into JSON. Use it when you don't have much, when you don't know much about the schema. You expect your data to pretty much change over the, you know, over the year, over the whatever it is. You know, your requirements is not really well defined yet. And use it when the schema is very likely to change. If you're logging the IP address today, and you log in the actual um, operation of the service that was accessed, and your boss comes in the next day and he tells you that you want to log in the credentials that were used, or he wants to log in the time or something else, it should be no problem in uh, Dynamo. And actually, this is true for a lot of NoSQL technologies. The challenge is complex joint queries are very hard. When you have two documents and you try to join both of them, it's very hard and self-referencing documents and circular dependencies are almost an impossibility. I um, mean, you couldn't have a document that kind of references to itself, a user references to itself. It would be very hard to pretty much like model in DynamoDB. Uh, projects featured, featured uh, MongoDB, CouchDB. Um, they also, ref uh, 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 some, I think CouchDB has like this rest, very nice REST interface uh, that you could pretty much uh, leverage as well for uh, a lot of people. So last thing I want to talk about is the graph data stores. Graph is a graph. Um, it's perfect for highly interconnected data. Allows for explicit relationship, fine grade relationship traversals, very flexible, works very well with OOP, no impedance mismatch. If you remember your graphs from your data structures, it's the exact, exact same thing. You could literally ask the question, who's the, fr um, if you have this social graph, for example, you want to know the friend of a friend? You could totally, totally pretty much just uh, get your answer like that because it's a graph. Um, it comes with, with chan I mean, use it when your data looks like a graph and it requires, it requires like graph questions, like graph traversals. The salesman problems is an example. And use it when you are smart enough not to try to do this on another data store. You want to be able to answer those questions in relational, in a relational database? Good luck. If you model it and you get good performance, good luck. Uh, the challenge is it does not scale horizontally, just like a relational database. You could take a graph and distribute it over a lot of machines. Um, it, it has, it's actually ACID. This is one of the NoSQL databases that is pretty much ACID. It's easy to do because it's all on the, on, on the one machine. Um, and the featured project for this one is Neo4j. Uh, since you can only scale on the one machine, you want to be mindful. Um, I'll delay this, uh, this, this thing until later, this comment until later. Oh, we don't want to forget about the relational databases. We have to mention these, uh, these guys. So this is the Jurassic Park of the zoo where the dinosaurs live. Use it when your data is highly relational. Use it when there is no need to break data into small pieces, when there is a need to break data into small pieces and assemble it in different way, reporting. 
you want to have, you know, this from this table, this from that table, and this from that table, and then report and then group them a certain way. Perfect. Nobody beats relational. Uh, use it when consistency is a must, because you're not going to immediate consistency. You're not going to get it anywhere else. And use it when the access patterns are unknown. You just don't know how these, these people are pretty much going to go and query your data. Uh, doesn't scale horizontally. We talked about that feature with project skip. You guys know. Um, how do you choose? Right. Um, if it doesn't fit, you might have to quit. I'm wondering where I got that quote from. But um, what you want to take into consideration when choosing the data store that fits your need best is the actual data itself. Does it have a natural structure? Does it like cluster? Um, does it relate to each other um, in a way that, um, I mean, what data, how does it relate to each other? I mean, if it's a graph, maybe you should look for a data store that is more or like friendlier towards like graph questions, for example, or like things like that. I don't know if this might not have made any sense, but you know what I mean, right? I hope. So, um, and how the data is connected to each other is extremely important as well. Um, how is it distributed um, and how much of it you have, more importantly. So you want to look at your data. How much? How distributed? How is it connected to each other and does it have a natural structure as your data? And you try to answer these questions. Uh, you want to actually talk about the access patterns. What is the read and write ratio it becomes extremely important. Are you reading more than you're writing and how much? Uh, because certain data structures, I mean, um, if you, the, the, uh, the compl I mean, hash tables have, uh, I mean, trees, for example, tree data structures are like the perfect for search, whoever it is. So you would, if you have a search problem, you would want to use like, for example, a tree and things of that, of that, of that. Uh, uh, but if you're writing or like you want, um, like constant lookup on certain, uh, on something, you might want to put like a hash table over there or, I mean, it's more, so it's important to know whether you're going to favor a solution that performs in reads uh, really well, but writes are okay, or whether you need both or not. I want to get there. And also whether how distributed, um, um, uh, whether your data is pretty much uniform or random. That one should be moved up to the data. It's really important to know how distribu the distribution of your data. Is it uniform or is it pretty much like random um, as well? And you want to actually look at CAP and figure out you know, which one of those letters you, you're willing to pretty much give, g give up uh, for the other ones. So other considerations, the maturity of a solution. A lot of these NoSQL databases are not mature. You know? uh, the stability of the code. Uh, the stability of the project itself, is it something that has a community around it? Is it something that is well maintained and stuff? Uh, the durability as well. Uh, are you in more interested in something that gets persisted to disk or you, you just want something that is in memory? Although some people argue that caches are not really NoSQL to begin with, uh, but that's something you might want to look at. Uh, uh, you might want to look at cost as well. How much is it going to cost you? Tooling, no, I mean, nobody beats RDBMS in the availability of tools and also the familiarity. I mean, this is a big learning curve for a lot of us uh, coming from uh, years, years of NoSQL and expect things to be a certain way. Uh, next. So for fairness, uh, relational data stores did not fail us. They didn't. Uh, they actually performed really well for what they were designed for. Uh, we kind of failed ourselves. If you have a Phillips screwdriver, you try to use like a flathead to kind of unscrew it, you know, you're kind of going to do it, but you're not going to do as well as the actual Phillips, if you use like the actual Phillips um, screwdriver to, to, uh, uh, that was designed for. Or sometimes it's just pretty much impossible to unscrew a flat head with a Phillips. Uh, so it's us using them uh, for things that they were not intended uh, to be used for. So take any data store and you'll get, um, take any data store, like any data store you get as much in, 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 in as, much, as much trouble as RDBMS. If we started with graph databases and we said everybody writes all their application on graph databases, uh, you're going to end up with the same thing because there's no silver bullets. There are always uh, trade-offs. Um, so, yeah, you can skip that. Now, polyglot persistence that 
we talked about in length um, how we got here, you know, and our um, journey with relational databases. Talked a little bit about the NoSQL and uh, you know, and got you know some of them. And we're gonna move to something to this like new movement called polyglot persistence. And before I go, uh, polyglot is this term that was first used by Neil Ford. He is speaking in this conference uh, for programming languages. He is a very big believer in uh, ones uh, that one of uh, that we should use different programming languages to solve different pretty much solutions within the enterprise. He wants an application where half of it is Ruby and half of it is Java and half of it is this, not just for fun to play around, but some problems are, are easier to solve with, uh, with uh, some languages. So the same way for like data stores, we're dealing with these enterprise applications that are very complex and they combine complex problems. Um, the assumption that we should always use one data store is just absurd. Um, you can try to fit it all in one model and, and, but don't expect no problems. Take all these problems and try to put them in a relational database, you're gonna have problems. Take them all and put them in a uh, column base, and you're gonna have problems. Uh, so they just don't all fit in the one model. So this brings us to the polyglot persistence, which is pretty much to leverage multiple data stores based on the way data is used by the application. They have multiple of them. Have your application have you use multiple of them? at the same time, strategically, of course. This is associated with a learning curve and a big risk. Uh, it's a long but it's a long-term investment because it becomes uh, more productive um, um, in, the, in the long run and you should do it really carefully and not go out of control. Like the guy that gets introduced to design patterns and starts seeing them all over the place. Uh, I was that guy when back in college. But uh, what this pretty much gives you is give you the ability to leverage the strengths of a multiple pretty much data store to provide the best uh, and the simplest solution for your problem. Uh, so an example, these are just pretty much examples. I would use MongoDB for product for a product catalog that's more likely to pretty much change and it has all these hierarchy of like, you know, home and then under home there is bathroom and under bathroom there's towels, wherever it is and, you know, some guy introduces an electronic towel so I should have no problem pretty much saying that this towel takes like batteries and things like that. Um, the MongoDB is very efficient in uh, have slow reads, uh, slow writes, but very fast, very fast reads. And so you have that ratio out there. So I would totally go with something like Mongo. Redis for shopping cart data is temporary and I need to pretty much just go and give me the shopping cart for this user ID and you get it right there. Use for example DynamoDB for like, a, um, um, for like social profile info. It's a key data store. Uh, Neo4j for the social graph, and I'm going, I'm going to go over there. Since this thing cannot scale vertically, um, it's completely okay for you to have the data of your social graph of only the ID of your users. So you have a graph of the ID of the users, and you kind of, kind of save in space. Their profile information is stored somewhere else. Their profile information is stored in pretty much DynamoDB. So you go and you have this user profile, you take the ID and you query Neo4j of all his friends, and you get all his, the IDs of his friends, and you turn around and you pretty much get the profile information from DynamoDB. So you're the one who actually holds that key. And with it, you can go and ask different data stores uh, in a way that is more efficient. HBase for inbox and public feed messages. We, depending on how much time, we can discuss why it's bad. I mean, I think Facebook use it for that particular purpose. Uh, don't quote me, I might be completely wrong. Uh, MySQL for payment and account info, $100 problem. And uh, Cassandra for audit and activity logs. Most important thing of the slide, I am not making any recommendation here. And um, by the way, don't just go and do this. This can be a management nightmare. You could totally fail if you, I mean, you wanna be very strategic. If it's a real problem, you know, maybe use two, maybe use one. Maybe three, I mean, depends. But you need to be aware that all your developers and all of the people who are working on this thing um, needs a lot of time to get that knowledge and that it's gonna take a lot of time for you to manage these data stores individually. Um, next. No SQL in the cloud. No SQL become a commodity. Talking about fully managed data stores, no maintenance whatsoever. DynamoDB is the perfect example. I love that thing. You don't have to worry about cluster management. I came from a company who actually had to manage our HBase cluster ourselves. There was, 
nightmare. It was really hard, and we're trying to do that on EC2 and wherever it is. Move away from that to use Dynamo, and everything is pretty much managed for us. And we could uh, scale in out, scale in down. It's a pretty much like a matter of, uh, of uh, a few clicks. Uh, elastic scaling, that's what you get uh, with uh, a lot of these companies right there that do hosted uh, Mongo and hosted NoSQL and very cheap storage. It costs zero on Dynamo to store. They bill you for, for, uh, for bandwidth, for how much data to query, but you could have billions of records of of over there and they were not gonna, they're not going to charge you anything. The ones I think on SSD or something. Featured Amazon AWS, um, uh, you know, uh, Heroku pretty much have a set of add-ons. Neo4j, I think is one of them, you know, name any NoSQL uh, database out there. And, uh, you know, Cloud Foundry, these are uh, um, maybe Heroku and Cloud Foundry are bo both PaaS. Amazon AWS kind of tethered some of their offerings are PaaS offerings. Some of them is just pretty much infrastructure for you to use. As promised, um, I'm going to answer my abstract has a bunch of questions. Those questions were designed to draw you guys in. And I told you I was going to have the answers for them. There you go. What does the rise of all of these NoSQL databases mean to my enterprise? I'm guessing a lot based on this presentation. What is NoSQL to begin with in a non-relational data store? Does it mean NoSQL? No. Uh, could this be just another fad? I don't think so. Personally, it's a matter of opinion. You're entitled. Is it a good idea to abandon RDBMS for all these new exo exotic, whatever it is? For my specific enterprise, it's up to you. I would say no guts, no glory. No. Um, I'll give you an advice, though. You don't want to go and uh, take the most critical piece of your application and start experimenting with these databases, because most likely uh, you are going to discover as you're learning that you pretty much made, uh, most likely made the wrong choice to store your data over there. You might want to get these like small projects that just like pretty much like float around, kind of experiment with it, get your technique down and everything. Uh, modeling is not simple. Make sure you know that really well and then tr transition in a way that is very graceful. Don't just go and say, hey, fire all the DBAs and don't do that. No, although uh, it's very tempting. So um, how scalable is scalable? However much you need it to be. You know, if you're uh, doing audits and you're interested in storing you know, five year worth of data, you probably would be fine with just pretty much the one server and just use an RDBMS, it's cheap and you're not gonna get in trouble because you only want five years of financial data, of audit data. If you want the forever and you think that you have all millions of customers and that thing just grows, you're gonna have to make the call right there and make the trade off for the right database. Uh, assuming that I'm sold, how do I choose the one that fits my need best? I'll tell you if you hire me. I don't know your needs. All depends to you. You know your needs more than anybody else. Uh, this presentation is just designed to kind of um, introduce you and tell you, give you like in a way, uh, you know, just um, a starting point for you to kind of know where you stand and uh, what the available technologies are there. Is there a middle ground somewhere? Uh, polyglot persistence is your middle ground. Um, what is this poly uh, polyglot persistence I hear about? It's the middle ground. So when you sit down and you realize that we deal with complex problems, they're all different. Um, it's just uh, um, fair to say that I am going to use this for this and I'm going to use that for that instead of going, all, go, going only like one direction. Uh, yeah, I think that does it. Thank you all for sitting through the talk. I really appreciate you pretty much being here. So.